on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. I'm Piers Morgan. I'm sent to tonight horror and carnage in the playground. A Syrian refugee stabs four children, one of them British, in a frenzied attack on a French holiday resort by the ladies from the scene. Also tonight, Rishi Sunak meets President Biden, who calls Sunak Mr. President and then forgets Winston Churchill's name. Is it all catching up on President Biden? We'll ask one of Fox News' top political experts. Plus, Roger Waters is slammed for wearing a Nazi uniform on stage. He calls it cancel culture. But is he just anti-Semitic? Well, Jewish rock royalty. Gene Simmons is live in the studio, and that is exciting. Live from the News Building in London, this is Piers Morgan Uncensored. Good evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. There are many words of British public associates with Boris Johnson's premiership. Chaos, parties, lies, shambles, scandals. Well, they all spring to mind. The word honour is definitely not one of them, even though he remains the right honourable gentleman. Few people have done more to dishonour the high office he held and the country he was supposed to serve. Johnson lied to the Queen and to Parliament. He bungled the pandemic, partying his way through half of it. He spent fortunes on golden wallpaper. He defended his disgraced cronies at every turn. And he did it all with a carefree, gurning grin and the sartorial elegance of a scarecrow. There can't be many people in British politics less qualified to adjudicate on honour, which is why it's frankly disgraceful that he's being allowed to move ahead with his personal resignation honours list. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who's in Washington, D.C. tonight, is about to wade through Johnson's gongs and peerages for his cronies and mates and, apparently, even his father, if he can get away with it. And, unsurprisingly, Sunak's not that keen to talk about this. I can completely understand the interest in this topic, but all I can say is there's a, a process that is currently underway. It hasn't concluded yet, and until it does, it wouldn't be right for me to comment any further. Yeah, but it's a process that I don't agree with, and nor do most people. It should be a very, very short process, to which the answer is a rapid no. Liz Truss, who was outlasted by a lettuce, shouldn't even think about nominating anybody either, but she will. If you resign in shame and disgrace, dishonourably, as Boris Johnson does, did, and Liz Truss did, why should you be able to then hand out honours? Isn't that just one final insult to the public? One last log on the giant bonfire of all things decent that raged through this terrible time at the top? I think it is. Well, we'll debate that later. <laughs> well, we come first with this dreadful breaking news from France today. There are a few things that have appalled me more than the scenes from this children's playground in France today, in the southeast of France, which just stopped you from what you're doing and gasp in utter horror. They show this lakeside playground in Annecy, a picture postcard alpine town where most people were relaxing in the sun on holiday until a Syrian man, a refugee who come via Sweden, began to unleash utter terror. Graphic videos, some too horrifying to share, show him stabbing a toddler in his pram as his screaming mother tries to defend him. The attacker, who was 31 years old, deliberately attacked children again and again. He could be heard shouting in the name of Jesus Christ. Videos show him running around the park, waving a knife he'd used on defenceless children as members of the public chased him, till eventually he was subdued and reportedly shot by police. The police say we don't know what his motivation is yet, but what we do know is that four children and two adults were injured in the carnage. A British child and little girls among the four children hurt. Two of those children and another are severely and critically injured. Well, I'm joined now by David Chasen. He's the France reporter at The Times, who is at the scene of the attack in Annecy, and in the studio by Talk TV International editor Isabel Oakshot. Well, let me start with you, David, if I may. Um, it's one of those things, when you, when you watch the video, it's utterly gut-wrenching to watch this man charging around, armed with a knife, deliberately attacking children, young kids in, in prams. Absolutely. It's completely horrifying. And the scene that people witnessed here this morning has left this whole town stunned. I mean, I'm standing now in the playground where the attack happened. And the noise you can hear behind me is a demonstration by a 
handful of right wing people. They've just sung the national anthem and they're now singing patriotic songs. Uh, people have come here and left floral tributes at the place where the children were stabbed. And uh, tonight, so four toddlers, including a three year old British girl, are fighting for their lives in local hospitals. The prosecutor here says that there doesn't appear to have been a terrorist motive behind the attack. Uh, it was carried out by a Syrian refugee who's been arrested. Uh, he described himself to police as a Syrian Christian and video of the attack shows him saying uh, in the name of Jesus Christ as he launched the attack. But local people and witnesses seem to think that he was mentally unbalanced rather than attacking the children for terrorist motives. Yeah, there seems to be reports that I've read that he uh, had married a woman in Sweden. He'd been living there for 10 years or so. So he came over as a refugee uh, a decade or more ago. There'd been no problems with authorities at all, uh, but that he'd split up from his wife and they had a young three-year-old child. And look, it's, it's wrong to try and you know, guess what has gone on here in terms of motivation, but you would think potentially mental health issues perhaps as a catalyst of what was going on in his own life. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the wife, the ex-wife rather, has spoken to French media. She, she, she says that she last spoke to him four months ago and he was living in a church here in France. Uh, it's believed he came here last autumn and he made a series of applications for asylum here, which bizarrely were rejected on the grounds he'd already been granted asylum in another EU country. But uh, according to his ex-wife, he didn't want to stay in Sweden because they'd rejected his applications for citizenship. And she says that he often looked after their three-year-old girl when he was in Sweden. And she described him as being nice-natured. So, I mean, it beggars belief. Uh, mental health issues may well be the cause. I think prosecutors have still got to get to the bottom of it. The police are obviously still questioning him and investigating judges also. So uh, we'll, we'll see what more comes to light. David, thank you very much indeed for that report from the scene there of this horrific atrocity. Much appreciated. Thank you. Isabel, I mean, I've got four kids. You've got kids. It's, we've all been to these playgrounds. It's like a little sanctuary, isn't it? You go, there's other little tiny kids running around. They're in prams. You can't think of anything more unthinkable than this. It is incomprehensible, this. particularly as we learn that the attacker is a father of a child that age. Yeah. I mean, you know, very difficult for anyone to perpetrate an attack mm. like that, but least of all someone who's got young children themselves. I think the question here is, are there any broader implications to this politically, mm. or is this just the most horrific act of someone who's perhaps suffering from schizophrenia, perhaps heard voices in his head, we don't mm. know. But what we've seen from our correspondent there is that there are already far-right demonstrations on the scene. Now, the issue of mass migration is already pretty toxic in France. France mm. takes a very high number of asylum seekers, many of them from Syria. That's the top country, uh, certainly before the Ukraine war. I don't know what the figures are now. And I think this will inflame an already very, very I mean, it will, but, I, but on that, it's interesting, because when I first saw that, I thought, mm. God, this is going to be a huge political issue, never mind anything else. And then you read, he, he, he got asylum in Sweden 10 years ago. It's nothing to do with it. You know, right. That's the reality, but it won't stop it from no, that No, I agree. We've debate. got some uh, breaking news, actually. Rishi Sunak has now just commented in Washington about this incident. All our thoughts are with those affected by this unfathomable attack, including a British child and with their families. I've been in touch with President Macron. We stand ready to offer any assistance that we can. Well, we're joined now by Eleanor Vincent, who was on holiday in Annecy. Uh, she's actually from California. Uh, Eleanor, thank you very much indeed for joining me. I understand that you turned up at the scene of this just after it had happened. What kind of uh, mood was there when you got there? Because this is such an appalling thing to have unfurled. Yes, it, it certainly is. Uh, the mood was one of shock. Uh, we were many meters away from the actual scene of the crime. 
It was already a crime scene. The French police were there very quickly, within four minutes. There were medical personnel. There was a life flight helicopter landing as I arrived. And everybody was on their phones trying to figure out what happened. I happened to have a live BBC feed update, so I knew the very basics because even the news media at that point didn't really know what had happened. And so I just uh, started taking photos of the scene. I'm a former journalist and in my state of shock, I thought, well, I need to do something. It might be useful to document what's happening. And so that's what I did. It's, it's sort of, it's a strange story in the sense. It's very hard to work out what motive there is here. The police have very quickly said, they don't think it's terrorism. The fact he's an asylum seeker 10 years ago coming from Syria to Sweden would suggest this is not a sort of immediate issue with someone coming from a war zone in the last few weeks. Uh, there may be a domestic issue, a mental health issue. He's split from his wife and had himself a three-year-old child, we understand. It's a, it's a completely baffling story, isn't it? Well, I personally don't find it so baffling. I find it horrific and incredibly sad. But it seems to me that someone from Syria coming, even having been in a state of living in another country like Sweden, which is, I understand, a very lovely country for 10 years, still can have untold amounts of trauma. And the fact that he split from his wife, he had a child that was three years old. And according to news reports here, he was seen hanging out in this park for three days. So mm. I can only imagine the state of mind that this person was in. Um, and whatever happened, he snapped and mm. lashed out in this horrific way. Yeah. I don't use it in any way, but I personally feel this is a mental health crisis and we'll wait and see what authorities say. Thankfully, he's alive so he can be interviewed and hopefully they can understand or try to understand what drove this. But absolutely, I do not think this is an issue about immigration. I do not think it's an issue about terrorism. I think it's an issue about mental health, of which we have abundance of in this world. And it's leading to untold problems of violence. In my own countries, there are three times as many guns as people. I partly came to Europe to get away mm -hmm. from the ongoing level of violence. But it's everywhere. And thank God this man did not have a gun. It, yeah. it would have been a bloodbath. Yeah. I mean, it's horrible enough as it is. Yeah. But <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. Eleanor, I really appreciate it. Thank you for your passion. Uh, I you appreciate know. it. It needs to be said. I appreciate you joining me. Thank you very much. You are very welcome. Yeah, I mean, it is. if he had a gun, there would have been far more people killed, young, young children killed. Indeed. I mean, I was struck by the many, many bits of footage that have come out, mm. how difficult it is for any bystander, even though it's not a gun, to tackle someone with a long mm. knife. I mean, there were several people who, who tried. Um, there was a very brave-looking adult who had a rucksack. Who there were a few to... who weren't so brave, by the way, in the video I saw, who were not doing anything. His women were desperately trying to protect their and, little and, kids. And that's, that's very difficult to put yourself in those shoes. Yeah. You hope you would try, don't you? But also, equally, it was so unexpected. Obviously, it happened so fast that there were people jogging past. Yeah, who didn't were. even realise that yeah. this was going on. No, so truly I'm, shocking. Absolutely horrific. Thank you very much indeed. Appreciate <clears> it. And since the next Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, it's just wrapped to join press conference with President Biden in Washington, D.C. We'll be live from the White House lawn with the very latest.
Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. President Biden said the UK's special relationship with the US is in real good shape today as he hosted Rishi Sunak at the White House. Probably better shape than him, I might politely and respectfully argue. Have you previously referred to his counterpart as Rashid Sanouk when he got the job? The 80-year-old uh, commander-in-chief this time introduced Sunak as Mr President. He also completely forgot Winston Churchill's name. Completely. Couldn't remember it in a bizarre, rambling anecdote about Churchill prowling around the White House. So how did the big visit go down in the US? Well, joining me now to talk about this is Washington, D.C. is Fox News White House correspondent Peter Doocy. Peter, brilliant to have you on the programme, first of all. Adding a touch of rare class to our show. Much needed. <laughs> um, so I watch you in these uh, press conferences at the White House and quite often you're taking them to task over the physical and cognitive competence or otherwise of the president. It wasn't a great day, was it, for them to show him at his best? Uh, well, at one point, uh, the prime minister had to bail President Biden out because he's trying to tell this story about Winston Churchill visiting the White House after the Pearl Harbor attack. It's, a, it's the stuff of legends in Washington, D.C. And as the president was kind of searching for the name Winston Churchill, Sunak bailed him out and then they kind of moved on. He did accidentally introduce him at first as Mr. President and then joked that he had demoted him. And then he, he corrected to Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, and so uh, that does follow. That, that is just about a week after President Biden fell down, mm. giving a commencement address uh, in Colorado. It follows him uh, getting the name of the South Korean Prime Minister, Yoon wrong. He called him uh, President Loon. And so it is part of kind of a long couple weeks for the president, Pierce. Well, let's take a little look, actually, a little greatest hits, if you like, of what you've just been talking about. Well, Mr. President, Mr. President, I just, I just <laughs> motor you, Mr. Prime Minister. We've got news that Rashid, Rashid Sanook is now the prime minister. As my brother would say, go figure. <laughs> a lot of stories that are told, probably a bunch apocryphal about uh, um, uh, the former prime minister, uh, like they take baths up there. Anyway. Wandering around at three in the morning. Yes. Yeah, Winston Churchill <laughs> bothering, uh, bothering Mrs. Roosevelt, yes. No, so no. You, you won't, don't worry, you won't see me there at no. uh, <laughs> bothering you and, and the first lady. I mean, on one level, Peter, it's kind of funny. On another level, it is, it is disconcerting for the rest of the world to watch the commander-in-chief of the United States of America sort of falling apart in front of our eyes. And, and that's just, that is what we see in public. We don't know what is going on behind closed doors, but you would hope that everybody is, uh, is as sharp as can be, considering the things that they were talking about. They're talking about these threats to the entire West that Russia poses. They're talking about threats of artificial intelligence, which President Biden today described as being like science fiction and, and ways to put together guardrails for that. These are very serious things that the leaders are discussing. And so uh, we don't know how it went. I'm sure that uh, this Biden White House doesn't really leak that much. I'm not sure how the, the 10 Downing Street uh, staff are about letting us know what happens in these meetings, but uh, we will uh, hopefully have some more details about how the president and the PM were uh, shortly. And Peter, the special relationship, the much vaunted special relationship, it's felt in recent years more special if you're here in Britain than it perhaps does to many Americans these days. How would you categorise the reality of the, of the so-called special relationship? Uh, the reality is, as somebody that covers the White House and literally every single thing that President Biden does, uh, it's been hard to keep track from here of who the prime minister even is yeah. over the course of the last 18 months. And, uh, you know, that a, a big chunk of President Biden's diplomacy comes at these summits where uh, the prime minister and the president are like two of seven or two of 20. They go sit at some hotel conference room for a half an hour. We get a picture and then you, you don't really hear that much about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and so President Biden hasn't gotten a chance to know any of the prime ministers well enough to really have any any sort of depth <laughs> to the relationship. And maybe that'll change now, uh, depending on how things shake out over there. But also over here, President Biden's up for uh, re-election. He just wants stability at home. Mm. I, I don't know how much of a focus uh, the special relationship is going to be 
for him when he's just trying to convince people in uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio to, to back him for a second term. But how damning that one of the main reasons the special relationship can't be that special is we never have a prime minister in the job long enough. I mean, Liz Truss lasted 44 days. I mean, a lettuce lasted longer than she did at the end. Um, Peter, just want to talk about something else. The, the smog issue, uh, that New York has currently got the worst air quality in the world, and it's all coming from these wildfires in Canada. Um, how bad is it? Even in DC, I'm told, you can smell stuff, it's weird, it's like the air's not right, but, but New York is looking apocalyptic. I, this morning, walking out of my car into the White House, the air smelled like about uh, nine or ten years ago when I was covering the Baltimore riots. Like, there was something right here that was on fire. And I think it is extraordinary that President Biden has said so little about this. He did very briefly mention it uh, near the top of his remarks, and he showed an air quality chart, and they put out a tweet and a statement talking about how they sent firefighters to Canada to try to help put it out. But this is something that affects millions of high-risk people. When we were dealing with COVID, even when COVID was not at a peak, uh, they talked about risks to high, uh, to, to vulnerable parts mm -hmm. of the population, elderly folks, babies. You don't hear anything from this White House about go stay inside. Maybe that's because they know that it is politically a, a bad time for him to tell people to go back inside their houses after the COVID lockdowns of a couple years ago. But, but he has said so little about something that affects so many people. And considering the fact that yesterday, so about 30 hours ago, probably around the time that he woke up, I was standing right here and uh, having a hard time uh, like swallowing because my mouth was so dried out from this stuff. Uh, it, he he just has not addressed it. It's something that affects him. He lives right here. I don't I don't know if he's been outside right. since it got here. I, we haven't seen him outside. They were supposed to have some party last night, uh, or rather tonight, and it's been postponed to Saturday. Uh, I don't know if he's actually gone out, but he can turn on the TV and see that it looks like the the mothership just landed in yeah. Manhattan. It really, and, it's it's amazing. Yeah. The scenes are really amazing. Um, Peter. Thank you so much for bringing us up to speed with all that. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Peter Ducey, one of the top reporters in America there. Well, Rishi Sunak was in the US to tout British leadership on artificial intelligence just days after one of his top advisors warned that AI could begin to kill humans within two years. It follows an open letter signed by Elon Musk and hundreds of the biggest names in tech, calling for an urgent pause in the development of AI. Well, Mo Gaudat, who's a former chief business officer at Google X, was among the first to raise the alarm. He says the situation is beyond emergency. And Mo, author of Scary Smart, which is a scarily smart book, by the way, joins me now. Mo, great to see you. Thank you so um, much. You were part of this uh, quite secretive Google X group, which I presume you were, your job was to think the unthinkable about stuff like AI. And you very quickly were out of the traps to warn people, look, this is serious. Very. What was it that you saw where you thought, OK, we've got to be really careful now? We had a tiny bit of an experiment that was about teaching robotic arms to grip items uh, that were uh, some funny um, developer used children toys uh, in front of those arms. And, and basically, they kept trying for weeks without any success whatsoever. And I passed by them and I was thinking we wasted so much money on something that wasn't going to work. On a Friday evening, one of them gripped one yellow ball, showed it to the camera. And basically, I was like, there you go, millions of dollars for one yellow ball. Monday morning, every one of them was, was gripping one, every yellow ball. By a few weeks later, every one of them was gripping everything. The speed that, at which those machines were learning is staggering. But at the same time, uh, the, the, the understanding we have about why they learn, why they do what they do, is very, very limited. Is that self-designing, what they were doing? They basically are mimicking human intelligence. I mean, the reason I asked that is I interviewed Professor Stephen Hawking just before he died, mm -hmm. his last television interview, and I asked him, what is the biggest threat to mankind? And he Artificial said... Intelligence. Well, well, actually, let me show you the clip. We've got it here, I think. Ever since the start of the Industrial Revolution, there have been fears of mass unemployment as machines replaced humans. Instead, the demand for goods and services has risen in line with the increased capabilities. Whether this can continue indefinitely 
It's an open question, but there is a greater danger from artificial intelligence if we allow it to become self-designing, for then it can improve itself rapidly, and we may lose control. I mean, it seems very prescient now. That was a few years ago. Yeah, I mean... But that I, was prescient. This is really what you're talking about. I, I, I left in 2018 a warning, and my first video that I issued after, mm. after I left was all about that. And the idea that, uh, um, you know, we always had three uh, boundaries, if you want, for AI. We said, don't put them on the open internet until you solve the control problem. Don't teach them to code, because mm. that makes them self-developing. Mm. And don't have other AIs prompting them, other agents working with them. And we've crossed all three lines. I mean, I remember with chess, I'm a big chess player fan. Not great, but I like playing it. And I remember when Deep Blue, I think, was Absolutely. the first. You won against Gary Kasparov. Right. That and, was but, it. and to start with, the Grandmasters beat the first ones. And yeah. then suddenly, Deep Blue won, and then it got completely invincible. And, and now, never no, again. Never uh, again did a human win. Well, no human can beat it, even the greatest Absolutely. players like Kasparov. So mm -hmm. that showed me how quickly robots, technology, computers yeah. can leapfrog past human brains. So, so let's stick with gaming. AlphaGo mm -hmm. uh, was designed by DeepMind, actually here in the UK, amazing, amazing team, to, to win in the game strategy game of Go, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it took them months and months and months and a couple of versions to win and, ha and be the world champion, if you want. Then they had AlphaGo Master learn the, the game without ever watching a human player play. Mm -hmm. they, the AlphaGo Master learned by playing against itself. Within three days, it won against the first version. Within 21 days, it won 1,000 to zero mm. against the world champion, which was already an AI. Do you understand that? Yeah. The speed at which they are learning. And this so, look, so look, talk me through timings here, because people have been calling experts in this letter, calling for a six-month pause. But if, if nothing is paused, if we carry on at the rate that we're going at the moment, what could happen? The reality, in my personal view, is that it is very difficult to predict. Something could happen tomorrow, or in four years, or in five years. I wouldn't say later than 2029. Most of our predictions... And when you, when you say something, what do you mean? What, what is the worst-case scenario here? Beginning of the worst-case scenario is that they are smarter than us, so they are not controllable. Right? And the thing that... And what would they do then? What would artificial intelligence do once it becomes smarter than human beings? There are would, it see, would it see us human entities as pointless? There are two stages of threat, right? And I think the biggest challenge we have in the world today is we're focused on the existential threat that we saw in science fiction movies. The closer threat is much worse, right? This mm -hmm. is an Oppenheimer moment. The one that controls AI has enormous power over, over everyone else, right? And basically, that means that everyone who doesn't control AI today is in an arms race trying to take control of it. This is why, when I think of the prime minister's move, it's a great move, overdue almost when you think about it, but so difficult to achieve because you have to unify China, Russia, and the US right. to, make, to, to be able to, to, to regulate and I mean, AI. a well-intentioned person trying yeah. to regulate and control AI would give it morality with teaching. That's the whole point. But, but a nefarious controller of AI, presumably, could teach it to be immoral, the opposite. Which is happening as we speak. There's right. absolutely no doubt. If you tell the drug lords of the world and the criminals of the world that AI is a super powerful tool, they're finding the way, a way to hack your bank as we it's, speak. It's scary. It is very, very concerning. And, and I think the reality is, interestingly, the only way you can defend against a super intelligence is through another super intelligence, which is what creates that prisoner's dilemma, what I call the first inevit mm -hmm. inevitable and scary smart, is, mm -hmm. that, is that we have to continue the development because if... Uh, you know, it falls in the wrong hands. We want the right hands to have power to defend us, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, that complexity of the situation is entirely about morality and ethics. Yes. And, and interestingly, the latest development of something like ChatGPT, for example, yeah. is using reinforcement learning, which is a very interesting technique because it basically allows a human to interface with ChatGPT and say, that was the wrong answer. Can you go back and think about what it is. What really, the challenge is almost like you're teaching a child at school. A hundred percent. And, you, you know, in reinforcement learning, I mean, in a simplified way, we're basically telling the machine to revisit its algorithm so that the answer becomes a cat, not a bird, right? Also, we can tell it that answer is immoral. Hmm? Can you re re revisit your algorithm yes. so that you become but again, more... But again, the problem I see is that you, if you're well-intentioned doing this process, yes. that's one thing. 
if you're teaching it deliberately to be immoral, yes. very quickly you could get out of control AI, which has very unpleasant tendencies. So, so, so my, taught, taught to it by human beings. Yeah, my 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 very clear statement is that. I honestly am not concerned with the machines, even though the existential mm. threats are possible. You're concerned with what humans teach I'm them? I'm concerned with humans, with AI yes. in their hands. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Let's end on a happier note. It actually starts on a desperately unhappy note. But you had this awful thing in your life where your son went in for a routine operation and ended up dying through a series of errors made by the medical team. And out of it, you could have fallen apart, like a lot of people may have done in that situation. But you turned it into a huge, extraordinary positive. Tell me what you did. I, I don't know, honestly. I felt in a very interesting way uh, that my son should not have left the world for no reason, that I could never bring him back. It was, it was f four hours, Pierce, between, between the moment he hugged me and went into that operating room to the minute he left our world altogether four hours and you have to get to a point where you say what do i do with this what do I, do I fall apart and then on my deathbed he's still not here or do i try to do something that reminds the world of his essence mm -hmm. and and believe it or not everything i've done since since 2014 has been influenced but by, by what that young man taught me and, and in a very interesting way this my work on ai and artificial intelligence my work on happiness my work on stress but tell me uh, about the work on happiness specifically i, I found um, a happiness equation basically you know when you deal with engineers we're weird people so so when i was very unhappy as a young man i couldn't actually find my happiness through the teachings of mm -hmm. you know sages and gurus and so on and i had to give myself a practical mathematical way of looking at it. I took that, I discussed it with my son, he taught me the hard side of it. And then I, I, you know, I wrote my first book, Solve for Happy, which basically was based on that, based on an idea that happiness is very logical, that if you can control your brain to have a, a, an interesting conversation with you, I can also control my brain mm. to become a little happier. Right? Maybe not to become absolutely happy, but to become a little yes. happier, right? And, and that got a lot of acceptance. Solve for Happy was mm -hmm. an international bestseller everywhere. And, and basically because the modern world as we know it is here. Yeah. It's no longer here. And so, you know, my first mission was 10 million happy, which was an attempt to make the world remember Ali, if you want. And then my second mission, 1 billion happy, was 100% because of AI. Amazing. Yeah. And ultimately, actually, it comes back again to the human brain. 100%. And the key denominator here, whether it's dealing with AI, whether it's dealing with your ability to feel happiness, actually, in the end, it's about the human brain. It's about being human. Yes. Brain and heart, intuition and anal analysis. It's about being human. Mo, it's fantastic to talk to you. Thank you very much for coming in. Scary Smart, the future of AI and how you can save our world. Well, it couldn't be a more important book at a more important time. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for having me. And since the next, I'll be joined live in the studio by Gene Simmons, the Kiss Rock legend. If that doesn't keep you watching, then honestly, I have no hope for you.
This is Talk TV. Well, this is exciting for me. Uh, I'm joined by rock royalty, Gene Simmons from KISS. How are you? How are you, young man? Well, it's great to have you here. Thank you. In the UK, in London, in my studio. In your studio. We go yes. back a long way. We do. We what? did Celebrity Apprentice. What? I knew it. 2008. <laughs> and just to remind anyone left in the world I haven't told... Go on. ..which one of us won? Go on. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yes, yes, he did. But only because you quit early. I and ha- if you hadn't, you'd have beaten me. Well, that's not so. But you're, you're very bright and good-looking. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is the case. You know what? You can come back any time, Gene Simmons. You're very kind. Now, your tour, it's, it, it, it's signalling that it may be the end. No, it is. It is. You've got to have... You know, at some point, we're all grown-ups. You've got to be able to understand when the curtain comes down. Everything's got to come to an end at some point. Have a little dignity and self-respect. Love your fans and understand when it's time to graciously thank them for an amazing journey that's lasted. But could half you really a walk away from the stage? Yes, yes. Really? Because the alternative is staying on the stage too long. The way who, Fox... who's, who has gone on too long in your estimation? Oh, many, many. <laughs> you want me to stop? Name and shame. Who have you looked at and gone? Come on, it's time. No, to... it's it's not fair. You can look. You can. You can see them by the number of creases on their faces and so on. <laughs> Mick Jagger. Rock, rock, <laughs> rock basically is a young man's, generally speaking, uh, form of music. And look, half a century is plenty of time to put on more makeup and wear higher heels than your girlfriend. So we've, <laughs> we've done this a long time. December the 2nd is going to be the last time, and we, we would love to see those few tickets remaining if there are any. Yeah. Some of our friends uh, in London at the O2. That's yeah. That's going to be the last time we will ever play. Really? And That's we it? Want, yeah. We want to play indoors instead of usually we headline download mm. or used to be called Monsters of Rock. Uh, we, we wanted a more sort of uh, emotional thing, because it is. What's been for you? I mean, if I could let you relive one moment of your entire rock career right now, which one would you choose? I would choose the beginning, the very first time we ever got up on stage, fourth on the bill, New Year's Eve 1973 in New York City. My heart was pumping like uh, nothing you ever saw, because you have to understand, when you come from the loins of the people, you know, sort of come up on the streets and you, you see these sort of godlike figures on stage having the time of their lives being adored. There's no other... Plumbers don't get that. Even the Pope doesn't get knickers thrown in his face. Well, he, <laughs> well, he, might, be Dave. he might, but I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> um, but this astonishing lifestyle. And I was never the best-looking guy and all that stuff. But as soon as you start strumming the guitar and, of course, sticking out my prodigious oral appendage... Boom. How, how is the tongue? Oh, it's... Very big. Can we have a quick flash? I would, but the floor is dirty. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. As, as being a rock star, has it lived up to everything you hoped oh, it would it's be? More. It's more than that. It's so many people moan about their life in show business. Oh, it's a... You've, nev- you've never moaned about he it. He thinks they protest too much. Yeah. One of your v- famous writers said that. It's mm-hmm. nonsense. How would you like to be have more money than you know what to do with, have more adoration? Oh, I forgot, you're Pierce Morgan. <laughs> you get that every... Thank day. you, Gene. Uh, I want to talk about someone else who's, who's in town, about Roger Waters, yeah. Pink Floyd. You're uh, obviously Jewish. He's been coming out... And, with and Israeli. And Israeli, and he's becoming a lot of very anti-Israel uh, and what people perceive to be anti-Semitic comments. I'm not sure that's the same thing. Right, so, so what's your position about Roger Waters? Well, first of all, he's a very talented guy. He's written some of the most wonderful music along with Floyd um, many, many decades, and it's obviously held up, and he's got lots of fans. There is something to be said for keeping your political and other beliefs off the stage. His choice is to use the stage as a platform to further his point of view. There is a difference between a political statement about Israel and about anti-Semitism. By the way, anti-Semitism also involves Arabs. The the Mm. definition of a Semite includes the Arab world. So I think uh, he's a well-meaning guy. I don't agree with his uh, point of views, of course. So do you think he's anti-Semitic or do you think he's anti Israel no, as a he's, state. I think he is, uh, from my point of view, inflamed 
angry about the political situation, mm. as we all are. You want there to be peace someplace. And look, I turn my, our attention to this wonderful fairy tale of a mm. country uh, or there are leprechauns and so on. Ireland, mm. the North and the South, yeah. so it's been ongoing for God knows how long. And the divisions are deep if you're either Protestant or Catholic mm. or different. And I've visited uh, Parliament there. We're going to come to that, as she yes. asks a break. Uh, I just want to play a little clip. This is Roger Waters today. He popped up doing some interview and he said this. My story is yet another story of cancel culture. Why are they trying to cancel Roger Waters? Why aren't there real journalists going, hang on a minute, this is <laughs> Maybe I'll call up and see what he has to say. Why aren't you? Piers Morgan, eh? Well, you know, the truth is, Roger, we have, for the last two years, at Piers Morgan on says, well, actually, about 18 months, six months before we came on air, and since we've been on air, uh, we have repeatedly asked you, these are all the stuff that we're showing on screen now, all the requests. And back came the response saying, no, not available, can't do it, too busy, on stage, off stage. So, Roger, you need to talk to your people because you've had a standing offer to come on Piers Morgan Uncensored the entire time we've been on air. Look, I'd like to jump in just for a quick second. The best way to have a discussion or even an argument is find common ground. Yeah. And then, and then get into the diversions of what you think. So what we agree with, and I'm Israeli and Jewish, my mother was in a concentration camp in Nazi Germany, and so on and so forth. I'm not saying this to get your... your heart pumping mm. anyway. We, we agree there absolutely should be an Arab state, Palestine. No question about it. It should exist side by side with Israel. No question about it. There should be free flow of information and commerce and so on. Okay, so it doesn't exist now. Let's work together mm. to try to make it happen. Mm. So what's the problem? If only it were that easy, Gene. But, you know, as always, you have a lot of clarity about these things. That's why I like you. Let's have a short break. We'll come back and talk about well, Britain and our parliament, you were there yesterday being fated like a, quite rightly, like a rock god, being begged for selfies by politicians. But what do you think of our system? What do you think of him, Boris Johnson? The shambles, as we call it. We'll have more from Gene Simmons after the break.
Coming up on the talk, four children fight for their lives after a knife attack at a playground in France. Rishi Sunak and Joe Biden commit to a new special relationship in Sunak's first visit to the United States as Prime Minister. And police vow to attend all burglaries in a new commitment to prioritising crime. That's all at nine o'clock. Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. With me, a Talk TV contributor, Paul Rowan Adrian, Talk TV presenter, Richard Tice, and the rock legend that is Gene Simmons. Well, Gene, yesterday you were in the heart of our British Parliament. Why? What were you doing there? Well, a uh, beloved and respected uh, MP invited me. Uh, as a matter of fact, as a statement of fact, there he is. Mm. Junior, his dad is a legend, of course. Uh, I was invited to come by and visit the House of Commons and so on. And so we have a jet we travel on. We were playing Newcastle, and all the airports were closed because Mr. Zelensky from Ukraine mm. was here, and for political reasons, the air... So I called up and I said, you know, I can't come because we can't land our jet. There was a phone call made by the MP, by the respected MP, and all of a sudden, we were the only jet allowed to land wow. in London. Wow. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> and we landed, and of course, I, I will tell you, I, I was a sixth grade school teacher in New York, in Spanish Harlem, before I stuck out my tongue for a living. Mm. And uh, to, to try to make 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds understand, in New York City, this astonishing little island, little by American comparisons, where a, a monarchy has existed mm. for over a thousand years. Mm. The amazing stories, the characters, and so on, and how this kind of transference of power, of course, the Star Chamber and, you know, King Henry VIII, who wouldn't get a divorce, like all this juicy historical mm. stuff. And then Guy Fox, notwithstanding, he didn't quite get there, but democracy came forth in full bloom, mm -hmm. and I saw it firsthand with, you know, it, sitting there respectfully and silently and watch it. And I will tell you, there's a bit of civility missing in American politics mm -hmm. because the fine gentleman uh, is addressing, mm -hmm. I would like to say, the, in essence, you're full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> it was all very respectful. Well, what? you mentioned the point because they call each other the right honourable gentleman. Richard yes. Tice, we have a situation now where Boris Johnson's honours list is about to be approved by Rishi Sunak. I don't think anyone who's been dishonourable and had to quit in shame and disgrace and broken the law and be fined by the police and so on, I don't think they should have an honours list. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the convention. Uh, but the, real, the reality is a deal's been done. Sunak has said, OK, you can have your honours list as long as you just lay off, give me a break, you do your thing. And then I suspect there's a deal being done with regard to the Partygate inquiry. So this is what's happened behind closed doors. Just mark. Well, he's way. now had his report, Paula, mm. uh, today, Boris Johnson, about the Partygate inquiry. And if it goes the wrong way for him, he's got two weeks to respond. If it goes the wrong way, that could be the end of his political career. Well, we know that he's had a, a warning letter as well, don't we, in terms of that, of that um, investigation. But you talk about his political career. What political career? Mm. Even when he was in politics, could anyone really say that he had a political career? Mm. He bumbled through various different mistakes. Um, we, we know that he has left us in such a, a derisory position in terms of where we are on the world uh, scale. No, who, who respects us? They're laughing at us. What do you make of Boris, G? Well, you have to... Uh... You have to consider that I'm an outsider and the view from far away is decidedly different than being in the mm. thick of it all. Mm. I'm a big fan of Boris. The body politic worldwide is really, as far as I'm concerned, what the story is about. You've either got the, the ability to confer with and make deals worldwide that then benefits the UK and the various countries they're in, or you don't. Bibi Netanyahu, who I've met a few times... Doesn't it start with your constituents? And where has he been for his constituents? And there's been a recent poll that suggests he's going to lose his seat. He's gone. By the way, he I, just lo well. I love watching Paula arguing with Gene Simmons about <laughs> Boris Johnson. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you don't I'm, get this anywhere else. I wore my fair. orange today, <laughs> my Just Oil protest. If I'd have known that you got permission <laughs> to land, I would have been there, Gene, with uh, my Paula, he was it's He was not, a dreadful it's, Prime Minister. It's not too late. But I just want to quickly put in... Right now, 
the people's business is being done by Mr. Sunak in Washington, mm. D.C., because there's a momentous and never-before-done deal with the U.K. and America, and I'm sure the news uh, people will mm. be uh, reporting on that. What I mean to say is that Mr. Sunak is in Washington, D.C., so perhaps I saw his deputy at the House of Commons addressing certain issues. It's the big story, folks. The world is, is as far as I'm concerned, the body politic. Yes, there will always be unions who complain, I don't have enough uh, social security stuff. And right, you can pay attention to that, but there's a big story, and as far as I'm concerned, Boris was a great communicator, perhaps locally was not as... Uh, a All right, well, let's talk about your own backyard, because you and I, when we competed together on Celebrity Apprentice, the person that chose me as the winner was Donald <laughs> Trump. <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned that enough, but he became president Every of the United week. States, <laughs> and he at the moment is roaring ahead in the polls to be a Republican yeah. nominee. Yeah. Given the state of Joe Biden right now, uh, even calling our prime minister Mr. President today, you couldn't bet against Trump getting re-elected, could you? There is a decent chance. You have to understand that uh, America is physically larger than Europe, and in the same way that the UK is not one. A uh, group of people. You've got the Celts and the Picts and different languages, different accents, and so on and so forth. And of course, lots of new folks from around the world coming here. So it's not one people. America, likewise. New York and LA is not Wisconsin and Nebraska. Who's going to win the American election? Give me a name Donald Trump. <gasps> wow. So wow. We can ignore all the cases, we can ignore the indictments, we can ignore the sexual it's assaults democracy and I, it's democracy. We I'm can not, ignore the fact I'm he's going to potentially making, be... I'm, he wasn't making a today. judgment, he just said he thinks he's going to win. I'm not even saying that I'm for it, but I will tell you, yeah. if I was Mr Trump, and I, Mr Biden, I think, is an ethical man, and so on, I call both Mr uh, out of mm -hmm. respect, somebody is going to run a 30-second sizzle reel showing Mr. Biden falling down. I totally agree. I totally that's, agree. That's what's Gene, we've run out of time. I wish I'd had you on for longer. Please come back soon. KISS are playing 5th of July in London, 7th of July in Manchester, 8th of July in Glasgow. They're back in December at the O2. It's the end of KISS, he says. I don't want to believe this. KISS should never end. It should be forever, forever long going like your tongue. <laughs>